The School at the Chalet Chapter 5 The Chalet School Opens By degrees they settled down in the chalet. The end of April found them ready to begin work. The huge room, which had been built to accommodate eighty people at meals, had been partitioned off into two good-sized classrooms. A third next to them had been made of a small room, which had been used as a lounge. Another one, on the opposite side of the door, had been turned into a sitting room. Sacred to Madge and Mademoiselle. There were no carpets on the floor, but they were brought to a fine polish with beeswax and hard rubbing. The furniture, with the exception of the schoolroom appointments, was all old. There was but little as yet. Miss Bettany intended buying here and there, and having it as good as might be. In the long kitchen at the back of the house, Maria Peffin reigned, with a younger sister and a cousin to help her while Brother Hans cleaned shoes and knives and attended to the huge porcelain stoves which warmed the place throughout. Dick Bettany's furlough was up on the 29th of April, and he had to say good-bye, and then before going to Paris express, since he intended joining the boat at Marseilles. Actually, school work would start on the following Monday, and Madge was very thrilled over that, for, in addition to Joey, Grizel, and Simone, she had four day pupils, whose parents lived around about. So they would begin with a very fair number. Joey and Grizel were just as thrilled as she was. Simone, though quite nice, was very shy and quiet. So when Monday came, they were all agog to meet the strangers. School began at 9.30, when a little body of schoolgirls were to be seen coming along the lake road, carrying books and chattering. "'There they are!' cried Joey from her vantage point at the window. Then a minute later, in amazed tone, she said, "'I thought Madge—my sister, I mean—said there were only four. "'So she did,' replied Grizel, joining her. "'Well, there's six there, anyhow, and one's quite a tiny one.' "'Let's go down and meet them,' suggested Grizel. "'Good scheme. Come along, Simone. "'Hello,' she said, holding out her hand in welcome. "'I'm Joe Bettany, and I know you're coming to the chalet school. "'Do tell me your names, won't you? "'And why there are six of you, when we only expected four? "'One, who was obviously the eldest, came forward and took Joe's hand. "'How do you do?' she said in careful English. You are Fräulein Bettany's sister, are you not? I am Giselle Marigny, and these are Gertrude Steinbrook, Bernhilda and Frieda Munch, and Betty Rincini, and my younger sister Maria. These are Giselle Cochran and Simone Lacture, said Joey. The two Marinese and Betty Rincini were slight, graceful girls, Giselle and Maria had very dark hair, and Betty brown with wavy brown hair and brown eyes. Gertrude was brown-haired and gray-eyed, and very pretty, and the two Manches were a fair German type. They were all between the ages of twelve and sixteen, with the exception of Maria, who was obviously not more than nine. Seeing Joe's eyes fastened on her small sister, Giselle apologetically explained her presence amongst them, and also Gertrude's. Mama thought that perhaps Fräulein, ah, but you say Miss, do you not? Bettany would be so kind as to permit Maria to come also. She is younger than we are, but it would be dull for her at home, and she is very clever, and Frau Steinbrook has long wanted to send Gertrude to an English school, so she is with us, and her mother will come herself to explain. Well, come in and take off your coats, said Joey, wondering herself how Madge would take it. This way in, this is our cloakroom. Have you brought slippers to change? Righto. We shan't do much in the way of lessons today, you know. "'Just getting to know what we know and about books and so on. "'You're the eldest, aren't you, Giselle?' "'Yes, I have sixteen years,' replied Giselle. "'And Bernhilda is next.' "'Bernhilda smiled at Joey, "'but she was obviously too shy to say anything just at present. 
She and Frida rather reminded Joey of two dolls, with their fair hair and blue eyes, rosy faces. She knew, because Madge had told her, that Bernhilda was fifteen and Frida twelve, but Bette looked about fourteen and a half, and Gertrude was evidently much the same age. When they had all changed, she led them into the first of the big schoolrooms, whither Grizel and Simone had already gone. "'Now we're all here,' she said. "'Shall we sit down? I expect my sister and Mademoiselle will be here presently.' They sorted themselves out, Giselle, Gertrude, and Bernhilda taking three desks at the back, while Bette, Grizel, and herself sat in the next row, and Frida, Simone, and little Maria occupied the front row. There was a minute's silence, and then came the sound of light, swift footsteps. A moment later, Madge entered the room, head well up, although her heart was being rather beating rather quickly. She welcomed them all with a pretty shy dignity, listened to Giselle's explanation of Gertrude and Maria, and assured her she was very pleased to have them, and then turned her attention to the business of the day. Prayers were followed by the working of some exam questions by all the girls, so that she might have some idea as to how to arrange them. As all lessons, save French and German, were to be taken in English, she found the foreign girls worked rather more slowly and would otherwise have been the case, and little Maria did nothing at all. The arithmetic was not done in the way to which she was accustomed, and there were many quaint turns of speech in the short English compositions. But on the other hand, both Joey and Grizel rather came to grief over the French, while Simone's German was dreadful, and Grizel's worst. Finally, after much consideration, she decided to work all of them, save Simone, Maria, and Frida, together in English subjects. Maria, Joey, Grizel, and Bette would form one French class, while the others would make another, and for German. Grizel and Simone would have to be specifically coached. It was also obvious that she must get another assistant as soon as possible. We are growing quickly, she mused. I only hope it continues. At twelve o'clock she finished work for the morning, and bidding the trollines to bring some sewing for the afternoon, dis this dismissed them for two hours during which she saw that the children had their lunch, insisted on Joe's practicing for an hour, and finally entertained Frost Dreinbrook, a stout, cheery lady, who informed her that all the Tiernsey was talking about her, and who prophesied that, in the summer at least, she would have quite a large number of pupils. At half-past two, punctually, all the girls were settled in their place again, and each with some sewing, and Mademoiselle took charge. Here both Joe and Grizel came off badly, since both hated their needles, and even little Maria was more expert than they were. Grizel mused, I wonder who will be pointed head girl, the first head girl of the chalet school. Ah, yes, I have read of these heads in your English school stories, replied Giselle pleasantly, and also prefects. Yes, I know Miss Bettany means to have this exactly like an English school, so I expect we shall have them, too. Then she began to giggle. Rather weird to have prefects when there are only nine of us. But soon there will be more, observed Bette Rincini, who up till then had worked in silence on Giselle's other side. Mama said at Mittenjensen, lunch, corrected Giselle. Ah, yes, lunch, that already many of our friends are telling about us. She makes no doubt that many more girls will come. How jolly, commented Giselle. I like a big school. Do you have big schools in Innsbruck? Uh, but yes, the public schools are very large. I did not go to them. Giselle and Maria and I had a mamselle, but... Our mamselle has gone away to be married, so Mamma is very pleased for me to come here. Brunhilde and Frida went to public school, observed Giselle, but they too are pleased to leave it. My father says that the English schools are deficient in education, but they give girls a more healthy life, and Herr Minch agrees with him. 
There are others, too, who think the same. So, as Bet has said, we shall without doubt soon become a large school. But our schools aren't deficient in education, said Grizel, firing up. You got a jolly good education at the high schools. But you have such a short period in school, returned Bet. You work for more for no more than five or six hours. Now we begin at eight o'clock in the morning and work till twelve. Then we begin again at thirteen and go on for another four hours. How ghastly, said Grizel sincerely, almost as bad as Germany. But in Germany, so my cousin Amelia has told me, they work even harder than that. And they have no games as you have. Well, we certainly shan't work like that, replied Grizel, decidedly. I am sure Miss Bettany would never hear of it. No, she is English, agreed Giselle. At four o'clock, the command came to fold up the work, and then the six-day girls got ready for their work home. The Marins and Gertrude lived at Tortswald, a small village about twenty minutes' walk from Spitz, and the Manches were at Spitz Gathus for the summer, while Bet had to go all the way to Braku. As it was a fine day, she meant to walk instead of taking the steamer, and Grizel and Joe volunteered to accompany them to Spat's Landing. Simone had disappeared as soon as they were dismissed, and they could not find her, though Joey ran, calling through the house. It was a delightful walk, and they found each other very friendly. Though shy, Frida only smiled and scarcely spoke at all. Giselle, Bet, and Gertrude were anxious to find out all they could about English schools. They asked many questions. They chatted on about school topics till they reached the Spets Gathsuls, where Bernhilda and Frida said goodbye to them. "'Will you perhaps come and eat an English tea with us on Saturday?' asked Bernhilda, just before they parted. "'Mama would be pleased if you would come, and Simone also.' "'Thank you, I'd love to,' replied Joey. "'Our first invite,' she said gleefully to Grizel, as they trotted back to the chalet. "'Well, what do you think of them all?' "'I like them,' returned Grizel with fervor. "'Giselle's a dear, isn't she? "'Do you think Miss Bettany will make her head girl?' "'Oh, I expect so. She's the eldest. "'I say there's Simone.' "'Hello, Simone. Why didn't you come with us?' "'I went for a little prom promenade,' replied Simone. "'Well, why didn't you promenade with us?' demanded Grizel. "'There's no need for you to go off by yourself like that.' "'You had enough,' returned Simone. "'Oh, Tosh,' declared Joey, in friendly fashion. "'You mustn't go raking off by yourself. "'There's only us three boarders at present, and we must stick together.' Simone looked wistfully at them, but made no remark. And as they had reached the chalet, the conversation was dropped. Chapter 6. Joey Gives a Promise By Saturday, it was quite obvious that the chalet school would have to enlarge both in premises and its staff. It had started actual work with nine pupils. In five days' time, these had swollen to seventeen two of them being English girls whose parents wanted to go to Norway and were not anxious to take their children on such a tiresome journey. So, as Joey said, there were two more boarders straight off. Amy and Margia Stevens were nice little people of eight and eleven who had spent most of their short lives in traveling since their father was foreign correspondent to one of the great London dailies. Margia, the elder sister, was a motherly person who adored her little sister. Amy was a dainty, fairy-like little creature who thought Margia was all that was wonderful. "'It really is time they mixed with the other girls,' said Mrs. Stevens, as she sat talking to Madge and Mademoiselle. "'But until this year Amy has been so delicate. I did not like to leave her anywhere, and it was out of the question for Margia to go alone.' We must go to Bargine, but I did not want to send them to a convent school when we heard of you. It seemed quite providential. Bet Rincini's cousin came from Innsbruck to live at Brakow 
with her uncle and aunt for the summer months, and it was taken quite as a matter of course that they should come with her. Then two sisters came from Scholastica at the other end of the lake, and two small children came from the Crone Prince Carl, where they were staying with their parents. It is awfully thrilling, said Joey to Madge on the Saturday morning as she sat curled up on her sister's bed. I didn't think school grew as quickly as this. They don't generally, replied Madge. It just happens that we've had a lucky patch. Joey, is Simone happy? She's such a quiet little thing, and those eyes of hers look naturally tragic. Are you and Grizel kind to her? I hope you don't go off together and leave her alone. Do you really think we'd do that and be so mean? demanded Joey, righteous indignation in her voice. Why, we haul her along wherever we go, when we can find her. But she's so odd. Soon as ever lessons are over, she slides off by herself. And where she gets to, in more than I can say. Madge let the subject drop, and suggested instead that Joey had better go to her own quarters. Joey left the room and went downstairs to the big dining room, where Maria was just putting a big dish of honey on the table. Simone was there already, looking, as she usually did, almost painfully tidy in her blue and white checked frock and long black pigtails. The chalet school uniform was to be a short brown tunic with chantung top, but so far Joey and Grizel were its only members to have them, although the others were getting them made, and Simone's, at any rate, would be ready by Monday. Her sister's question had aroused fresh interest in the little French girl in Joey, and she regarded the young child gravely as she saluted her with the pretty trioline greeting. Gruscott? Bonjour, said Simone soberly. She was rather white, and her eyes looked as though she had been crying. Why don't you give me the God's greeting? asked Joey laughingly. I think it's such a nice thing to say to anybody. She came closer. Simone? Why have you been howling? Aren't you happy? I'm very happy, thank you, replied Simone with dignity. Then you don't look it, retorted Joey in her most downright manner. If you're happy, why don't you chirk up a bit? Simone lifted tragic dark eyes to her face, but anything she might have said was lost, for Grizel came running in at that moment, followed in more stately fashion by Mademoiselle, and Simone promptly became muter than any oyster. As a matter of fact, all that was wrong with her was that she was dreadfully homesick. She had never been away from her mother before in her life, and wanted her badly. She slipped off again as soon as breakfast was over, and while the other two were chatting, Joe missed her presently as she went off quite cheerfully to what was for that moment known as the junior form room. Slipped off again, she thought, Simone. Simone, she raised her voice in a long, melodious call, but no Simone answered it. Simone, where are you? Simone. No response came, so she dashed upstairs in complete defiance to rules to see if the small girl had taken refuge in the dormitory. But when she pulled aside the pale yellow cubicle curtains, she found the cubicle quite empty. A hasty rush through the living room helped her no further, for Simone was not there. Maria, went, re, Maria, when questioned, declared she had not seen the young lady since breakfast, and she was sure she was with neither Mademoiselle nor Fräulein Bettany, for they had gone off to Spitz half an hour before. Joe wandered out into the warm sunshine, turned to gaze at the Berenkopf, a mountain which greatly took her fancy, although they had not climbed it yet, since it was considered dangerous, at any rate for amateurs. I'll have a shot at that some day, she thought, as she looked at the bald, rugged outlines. Then she gave an exclamation, for among the trees which clustered at the foot of the slope of the barnbald, another mountain she had caught a flash of the blue and white frock which Simone wore. So that's where she goes, she thought, as she raced across the flower-bespeckled grass which lay between her and the woods. 
She soon reached them. But by that time, Simone had disappeared, and although Joey shouted again and again, there was no answer. Finally, just when she decided to give up the hunt and return home, she stumbled over a root of a large tree and went headlong onto a nest of old leaves. And there was Simone, sobbing as if her heart would break. Simone, what's up? Don't cry like that old thing. Aren't you well? At the first sound of her voice, Simone had half sprung up. Then she collapsed again into the little huddle she had been when Joe found her. Is anything up? asked the latter again, as she made a violent effort to pull the other child into her arms. Tell me, Simone, old thing. I want my mother, sobbed Simone in French, so that it was all Joey could do to make it out. I want my mother and my home. You poor kid, Simone was exactly ten weeks younger than Joey, but for the present the English girl felt very maternal towards her. You poor kid. There, there, don't cry, old dear. You'll be all right soon. Simone stretched out a hot, sticky hand and grabbed Joey's. I am so lonely, she sobbed. You and Grizel are such friends. I say we didn't mean to make you feel out of it, replied Joey, whose conscience was very busy at this time. Honor bright, we didn't. You are of the same nationality, went on Simone, who once she had started to make confidences evidently meant to go on. You live in the same town, and know each other well, and me, I am only one, and now there will be two more, and I shall still be only one. Simone, Joey said, it's awfully sorry Grizel and I have been such beasts. I quite see we have been beasts, even though we didn't mean it. Now, I want you to mop up, here's a hanky, and come back with me, and we'll start again. I'm sure Grizel will see it, and we'll all be pally together. But this was not what Simone wanted. Truth to tell, she was convinced a violent affection for Joe and Grizel, with her vivid pettiness and more obvious qualities, repelled her. So she sobbed on, while Joey sat, nearly distracted, and not knowing what to do. "'Simone, I do wish you'd stop,' she said finally. "'Do stop crying, old thing. I'll do anything I can for you. Honest, I will.' Simone made a big effort. "'Will, will you be my friend?' she croaked out. "'Of course I will. I am. Both of us are. No, I mean... My ami in te me. Oh, Joe, you only would, I think. I should be happier. Grizel makes friends with everyone. Giselle Marini loves her, and so does Bettany Rincini. I don't want her. I want only you. Joe promptly hugged the younger girl and said, Righto. We'll be pals. We'll be best friends. And now do mop up. There's a gem. You will be my best friend, persisted Simone, even as she scrubbed her eyes hard with Joey's handkerchief. You will relate to me all your secrets and walk with me? Yes, as long as it doesn't interfere with other people, responded Joey. I can't tell you other people's affairs, Simone. And look here, you mustn't come rushing off by yourself. It might come on a thunderstorm or anything, and you shouldn't know where you were. At least I should now, but others wouldn't, and it might worry them. I will promise to do it no more, replied Simone soberly. Simone accepted the hand Joey stretched out to her and got to her feet. You're all leaves. You'd better let me brush you down, said Joe. You'll have to change before you go over to the Manchis this afternoon. You can't go in that frock now. It looks as though you'd slept in it. They went slowly down the slope and crossed the grass to the chalet, where they were met at the door by Grizel, who had just finished her practice. Hello, she said. I've just finished. What shall we do? I'm going to practice, replied Joe. I haven't touched the keys yet. Not practiced? But you went when I did. Well, I changed my mind. I've been out with Simone, so I've got to do it now instead. And she's got to change her frock. Come on, Simone. 
said Joey, as she vanished into the house, leaving Grizel looking after her in startled fashion. Simone followed her, and Grizel was left alone to wonder first what on earth the French child had been crying about, and second, why Joey had left her practice till this hour. She could come to no satisfactory conclusion, so she gave it up, and wandered off into the landing stage to see if any visitors were coming. As the steamer was just crossing from Bacho, she was rewarded for her interest by seeing a party unmistakably English leaving the boat and giving their luggage in charge of the porter making for the Troiler Hof, one of the largest hotels in Brissu. What interested her most was the fact that besides a lady and gentleman, who looked very bored, there was also a girl of about her own age. I wonder if they were staying long, she thought to herself, as she turned and went back to the chalet to see if the other two were ready to come out. Perhaps it's, it'll be another pupil for the chalet school. Oh, I do hope so. Miss Retro Reads is brought to you by Anchor. Just as a boat needs an anchor, any podcaster needs a place to go and perform. Anchor is a great tool for you to perform your podcasts, and they distribute it any place you're listening to this now. Consider using Anchor for your podcast. Thank you for listening to Miss Retro Reads.